I am Dean Radcliffe on Twitter at Chicago Grooves because I'm from Chicago. But I am excited to be working with Paul and Carl and the others at OK Grow and getting to work on Meteor full time, which is really exciting. Um, but when I talk about asynchronous programming and promises and fibers, some of you might not know uh, that these are not really Meteor concepts, particularly async and promises. Um, so I don't want them to sound too jargony, because in fact, I think one of the coolest things about using promises and fibers to do async programming is that you're not caught into any one brand. So I think this will pre be pretty jargon free. Uh, you won't hear any fancy method names like component did mount. I won't be talking about scopes or directives or anything like that. But don't let the simplicity fool you. It's very, very powerful stuff. And I hope to build up to a nice demo uh, where you can see some of the amazing things you can do without any particular framework. And this code will apply to client and server as well. So with that, I begin talking about promises, values decoupled from time. It's a bit of a, a cryptic way to describe something. What is a value decoupled from time? Well, in fact, we use this concept uh, all the time. So for example, if we were to make a bet, um, and I said, provided the Blue Jays do not lose to, I don't know, what's another baseball team people care about? Yankees. Provided the Blue Jays do not lose to the Yankees this season, I have no idea how likely this is or not, but I'll pay you $5. So we make a bet. There's an uncertainty to that outcome. It hasn't happened yet. Or maybe the game is in progress and we make this bet, but we're describing an outcome and what happens after that outcome. Now, if I had said, provided the Blue Jays are undefeated to the Yankees this year, and made you a bet. Provided the Blue Jays don't lose to the Yankees this year, um, I'll, I'll pay you uh, $100, right? Had the Blue Jays already lost to the Yankees, would you still take that bet? I might have described it in the wrong order. Hey, have you known that the thing that I was describing that I thought was a possible outcome was an actual outcome that happened in the past? I don't know, if it was, if it was a friend, you probably wouldn't take the bet. But, uh, a lot of people would take the bet and consider it a valid bet that said, well, you didn't know that they lost, but you said, provided they don't lose. So, I don't know. That's, the, that's an outcome uh, that may have happened in the past, may be in progress, and it may happen in the future. And so that's what a value decoupled from time is, all right? So, um, how does this work in code? Oh, by the way, that's lovely Wrigley Field, uh, one of those last, you know, analog scoreboards in existence. It's pretty beautiful. So how does this work in code? I hope you can see um, this slide, but I'll pretty much summarize what's on it. So suppose you have a loaded document, and you say document add event listener for DOM content loaded, and you pass it a function that does console log ready. Will it log? Will it not log? How about if you do the jQuery document.ready and pass it a function? Will that one log or will it not log? Well, it turns out, well, as it's described, the first one will not log and the second one will. Ah, but not if you had used this document.onReady. What's the difference between those scenarios? In the first one, you are highly coupled to time. So you're saying, add an event handler now add an event handler now that will respond when the document is loaded. Well, if the document's already loaded, you missed the boat, right? So that is something that's too tightly coupled to time, in a way. Uh, this second one, this jQuery one, uh, that, that's document.ready, it turns out if the document's already loaded, it will run that function. So that has the semantics of provided the document is loaded, Right? whether it has been loaded or even if it's about to load or if it will load in the future, run this function. This one is decoupled from time, but not the other one, which is really just uh, an, an analog for add event listener. So um, this is kind of tricky if you need to navigate these waters. And so the promises standard exists to make it so that when you deal with promise objects, 
you don't have to concern yourself with which flavor of document not ready it is. You can write a promise for the, con the content being loaded and then cause events to uh, happen whenever that promise has been fulfilled. And talk about fulfilled and resolved and rejected. So what is a promise other than a value decoupled from time? It is a stand-in for a value. Whether it's already known, it's being computed in this turn of the task queue. I'll also refer to the task queue as an event loop. You've heard of the JavaScript event loop. Um, and uh, Or if, if the value is not yet knowable. So imagine that we had an object called DOM content loaded promise. And it represented the eventuality of the DOM content being loaded. Well, we could just pass a function to its then handler. And if the uh, document was already loaded, this would evaluate as a resolved promise and then do the logging. Or if the, if the uh, document had not been loaded, it would uh, create a pending promise object. And then as soon as that, uh, as soon as that event occurred, the um, function would be run. So in this case, you know, I said that a promise is a stand-in for a value. You can kind of ignore, in this case, we're ignoring a value, and we're just using it to trigger events, and that's a total valid usage. But for example, you could, if you wanted to depend on upon a value, you could say, when the document is loaded, console.log the size of the document, right? You wouldn't know that until it was loaded, so it could be a promise for the eventual size of the document. Could also be a promise. Is that making sense? Okay, cool. We'll get into some better details. Okay, so uh, this is a little hand drawing um, about the event loop and why this is important. Because asynchronous code, of which there are countless varieties, and I'll kind of show you a diagram that a lot of the things, fibers, async promises, they're, they're all one type of asynchronous code. And then most of the code you write, including regular uh, document events or jQuery events, are synchronous code. So I want to give an illustration of what it means to be synchronous or asynchronous. And so I drew uh, this accountant-looking guy who I call uh, Mr. Node. And actually, he's Mr. V8, right? So the JavaScript engine um, has, a, has a guy in it we'll call Mr. V8. And uh, he sits there to do work to completion, all right? If you've ever worked with someone who just once you give them a task, you could, you know, the building, a wall could fall off the building and you wouldn't notice. He'd still be finishing that task. Um, that is how a JavaScript uh, runtime, like the V8 engine works. And it runs to completion as much as possible. But sometimes it needs to uh, get additional information to continue. So we have uh, these different tax forms, right? Has anyone filled out a, a, a series of tax forms you'll, yourself? You'll know the situation. You say, I'm going to do my taxes. And you pull your tax form on your desk. And you start filling out things, how much you made last year. And then there's this line that says, uh, place the value of line 7 of schedule K1 here. And you're like, I don't have K1. OK, so I'll take K1 and put it on top of the 1040 that I was filling out. And then I start filling that out. And then I get to a thing that says, enter line 3 from worksheet A here. And you put another one on the stack. So this is literally a stack of documents. And literally, this is what the call stack in JavaScript is is a series of functions that call functions that call functions. And once you've filled out worksheet A and you know what line three is, you can plug it back in to schedule K1 and then 1040. And then only then, when the first uh, item at the bottom of the stack has completely been processed, can you return and then pull something else uh, that's waiting in the wings off of the uh, event here. I think I can take this with me if you don't change. To the thing. Okay, so the things that are on the task list are when a user clicks and you've, you've written that on a click, run this function, that might be this one waiting there. And then there might be another thing waiting there. So each event that a user triggers or that your code asynchronously triggers 
is an item on the task list. If you've done uh, an AJAX request, you've passed a function to the AJAX request. When that AJAX request completes, that function will be something waiting in the task queue. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Yes? So is it actually, is it changing the way I would develop that script? Or is it changing the way that the server or the browser actually handle processing that kind of request? Um, prom you mean, is using promises changing any of this? Yes, so I understand saying? it's a di different way to code that. It's a different way to code that, but it's going to work exactly the same way underneath. So this, this is the way that it works underneath regardless. Okay. Yeah, good, good question. Um, yep. So, yeah, so here, um, here we're going to compare the two. So in synchronous code, you can start with the 1040 form and go down to the K1 form to, to ask for a value. It doesn't have it. It goes down to the worksheet A form, goes to the user. The user provides the values, and it goes back up. And these dotted lines represent separate turns of the event loop. And if you're writing a chain of functions that call each other directly, this is what happens with your call stack. I'm sorry it's represented going downwards, but the arrow of time is off to the side. In asynchronous programming, that includes reactivity and AJAX requests, you can never go back in time. You can't have a reference uh, that points to another turn of the event loop. So you have to structure the code that you write in such a way when you're doing async programming uh, to take a user's values that they need for worksheet A, and then that completes, and then you can say in the future, because um, maybe you're going to allow some of those event clicks uh, that, that the user has done to get processed in the meantime. Maybe you're going to be polite and, uh, and allow some other work to be done, but you're going to set up your work so that um, bits and pieces of it can occur in their own pieces of the event loop. And so when you saw that promise object dot then and you pass a function, if you create a chain of those, each function will run in a separate term of the event loop. Okay. So um, there are only two ways of coding JavaScript, the synchronous way that I described and the async. And callbacks, where you have a function that takes some values and then a callback parameter, um, promises, uh, reactivity and on the server fibers, they're all equivalent, all right? But they can get pretty confusing. But they shouldn't be confusing because you can convert back and forth between them, right? So has anyone ever used meteor.wrapasync on the server to like do like an HTTP request or, or you work with some NPM library? And that converts it into a fiber-based call, um, which will cause parts of your code to run in one part of the event loop and parts of your code to run in the other part of the event loop, but uh, it'll convert it for you. So there are actually converters to go back and forth between these styles, except that on the server is the only place you can use fibers. Okay, so I think these are the unsung -sung heroes of async, and um, a lot of people think so too. It's being standardized, uh, the Meteor core team is working promises throughout their code base. One of the reasons that they're doing that is that promises work on the client and the server, and fibers only work on the server. And Meteor is into isomorphic JavaScript, right? And, and it's an ease of coding. And so if you can, if you do an HTTP call on the server and you, know, you can do it without passing a callback, how come you can't, how come you have to pass it a callback on the client? Right? That's not entirely isomorphic. And I think you'll see big changes in Meteor coming very shortly regarding um, the, uh, the, the, the way it handles promises. And so you might have been passing callbacks all around, and um, callbacks have an implicit contract of behavior, whereas promises have a specification, and every promise implementation is obliged to um, obey the specification. I'll get into that in a bit. So now, let's assume that you have promises. Let's assume that there are tons of API functions you can call that give you promises. All the things where you would have uh, passed a callback, imagine there's a promise returning version. How do you get at that value? So prime example being meteor.call, right, where you can call a server-side method. 
Um, that currently requires you to pass a callback. If, it, uh, if you use a certain package that I'll describe, you can get a promise for that call. And then how do you get access to the value, the return value of that call? Well, you chain onto the promise with dot then, and you pass a function. Now I'm using the ECMAScript 6 function definition, but if you want to just imagine the word function and the word return in there, go right ahead. I didn't think anything was lacking on the slide by omitting those, but I understand that might be new. <clears throat> so, um, so in fact, I, I kind of lied. There's actually two functions that then takes. One of them is the happy path function that gets a value. The other one is the non-happy path that gets an error. Ah, sad face. Well, callbacks have a convention in Node where you, get, you, you pass an error parameter first and then a result parameter second. And that's kind of unfortunate because you usually your happy path code looks a lot different than your sad path code. Uh, and to, to force you to combine them into one method is, is kind of silly, right? Why did, we, why did we allow that to happen? Um, it's much nicer if your error function and your happy function can be on two separate paths. Also, if you, make a, uh, if you, if you don't pass a then function, uh, an error callback, you can just check, tack it on at the end using dot .catch. And beware different promises impl implementations have other aliases for catch, um, but catch is a standard one, all right? So uh, you can chain these together and be back on the chain game. You can say dot then this, dot then that, and each step in the then may do basically four things. It can raise an exception, it can return a rejected promise, which is the async version of raising an exception, it can return a value, or it can return a promise for a new value. And I'll show how these combine in just, just a bit. Exceptions, if one of your steps actually raises an exception, okay, just, you know, something goes completely out of hand, it will not blow up your whole chain. That, uh, that catch clause can occur after any number of these thens, and if any one of them threw an exception, you can catch it here. And you can also pepper these throughout. You can have a then and a catch, but if you're doing that, you might as well use this style. But one of the cool things about um, this is that whether, um, if you've ever forgotten to check the ERR parameter of a callback function, and I know some of you have done it because it's a real pain in the butt to do that at every step, um, promises let you do that uniformly where you deal with async exceptions and sync exceptions in the same way. So a catch at the end can handle errors for the whole chain. And that saves a lot of typing, but a lot of edge cases that you'd be likely to miss. Huh, what's wrong with callbacks? Well, I mentioned they don't conform to any specification, but this pyramid of doom example is something that people have seen who've worked deeply with callbacks. So promises let you flatten that out. But it's not just an aesthetic distinction. If you are actually doing what you should be doing, and I know this text is getting small, but that's because in order to do proper exception handling with callbacks, you need to do two types of checks at every level. You need to, oops, I forget I can't highlight code here. You need to check whether the function passed you an error object and call back with that, but then any sub-step you have to wrap in try catch to propagate the error exception. And this, I originally, this example had three levels deep, and I just said, enough, I'm not, that's too much. They can't read what's on the slide already. So this is what you have to do to properly handle exceptions without edge cases with callbacks. Uh, or you can just do this with promises. So I think this should show you why I think uh, this is for the win. You will miss fewer error uh, cases with this. Um, I don't see pizza here. This would be a good time to pause for pizza or pause for questions. Anyone? Yes? If there's an error in your chain, the first error goes out and the rest of them don't continue, right? The rest of them, yes. If there's an error in the chain early, uh, the intermediate steps will be skipped and it, your control will jump right to the catch at the end, right? 
group them and run them together? You can. You can. You can change. You can put a then and a catch, a then and a catch, uh, or put the two functions at the same time. Um, you can't exactly tell which step through the error if you fall all the way down to the catch. Um, so there's a a lot of uh, better tutorials than I'm going to get into about how to how to chop it up if you have a workflow that you want to uh, handle in different parts. Okay, well, so yeah, must handle two different types of errors and, and uh, okay, this is just, I think I've said all this. Uh, oh yeah, oh, this is just interesting. I'm not gonna in belabor these points, but um, the, the callback contract where you get an error and a null, um, I watched someone's podcast about um, how they are supposed to work, and I had no idea that there were so many rules about how they're supposed to work. For example, the first argument should be uh, an, an, an error, well we know that, and the second argument is the result, but you should never, your callback should never have to expect uh, an error and a result to come in at the same time. And yet, who knows how the author of the program wrote it. They might think they're doing you a favor by returning a string in the error property and a result, but that would be forbidden. But people could do it with regular uh, callbacks. And then, the, it shouldn't be a string, this error parameter, it should be an instance of the error class that captures stack trace information and other useful stuff. Um, but again, the author of whatever callback implementing library might not know that. If they implemented their library to return promises, you could count on these things being true. And there's a lot of them. Uh, must never execute on the same tick of the event loop. That means those dotted lines that I showed you, like it has to be in the future. And uh, any return value might be ignored. These are just rules that you could easily uh, fall into violating unknowingly. Um, and it's fine, the programs calling your library might work fine, but they would know a little more than they should about the internal details. Well, this is the slot I had for a comic relief cat picture. Um, I couldn't find one, there weren't any. <laughs> All right, no pizza yet, but I'll keep going. So, now, let's say you want to write, you're writing a library, and you know that it's going to have to do some async work. You don't want to have to write uh, a callback style thing. You're convinced, you know, show me promises, they're the new way. How do I write one? Well, suppose you're exposing a, and uh, get an async value. So suppose that this is like, I don't know, the body of an HTTP request, or, I don't know, something more sophisticated you're doing in your library than that. Well, basically, you need to return from your function a new promise. But, what does the promise contain, and when does it get fulfilled? Well, you need to pass a function to the constructor, and the function will receive two uh, parameters, which are each functions themselves. This is highly functional. This is gonna be a little confusing resolve and reject. So you can actually name these whatever you want, but when you pass a function to the promise constructor, you get these little handles that you can then use to uh, give the promise ultimately a value. You would call the resolve function with the value, and if the promise failed, so the Yankees beat the Blue Jays, you would call the reject function. Now all that remains for you to do is to fill in the body of this. So you put in whatever async kind of code would occur in here that takes a callback, something like set timeout, that takes a function that will be executed in the future. And all you do is make sure that that resolve function that you got as the first parameter to the constructor gets called with the eventual value. And it's important to note here that this resolve and reject the user of your library that gets the promise you return, they can't resolve the promise, they can't reject the promise, they can't even ask the promise its value in, at this point in time. All they can do is pass a function to it to receive its value, right? So this, the, the moment that you're constructing this promise is the only time you have access to the means to resolve it or reject it. So that's pretty much it. Um, it looks a little bit uh, kind of 
boilerplate, but you get used to it after a while. And I'll show you some examples that, that, um, that really make a lot out of this. As an alternative, you, you can accept a callback and run a function on your function, kind of like meteor.wrapAsync, which takes in a function that's one style and returns a function that another style. Um, but you can also do that in the re reverse direction where you write it in terms of promises and then for people who really want to use callbacks for some reason, uh, you can expose a callback version of that just with a simple mechanical transformation. So that is uh, it. And I wanted to mention too that like this example before you set timeout to ensure that, you know, that, that the resolve happens in the future. But suppose you already have the value. Remember that DOM content loaded example? You want to have a promise for when the document is ready. Well, if you know that it's ready, you can just resolve immediately with here it is. And the thing that's returned from here has, uh, it has that string contained in it, but you know, if you were to just return the string, nobody could tack dot then onto the string and chain things. Um, so if this were just one step in a chain, um, you, uh, if this were the beginning of a chain, you'd want to return promise.resolve so that you, know, you set up a, a way to chain promises. All right, what's next? Ah, yes. I really, I really had no excuse not for getting a non-cat picture. Uh, OK. So um, I'll go right through to an example. So um, I'm excited to be working with uh, OK Grow, and I've been, yes? Um, are you going to cover how to raise or throw an error? You, OK, yeah, there are, yeah. The question was, can I explain how an error would be thrown? So um, you, you can call promise.reject, and that uh, will explain, uh, that, 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 will, that will throw an error. Now, this function I'm portraying outside of any chain of promises. If you have a chain of promises, dot then this function, dot then that function. Any function participating in the chain can just simply throw an error, like regular exception creating style, and it won't break the chain. Or it can return a promise.reject, and that won't break the chain either. So either type of error um, can be handled by a chain of promises. But if you're writing this from scratch, you should catch all errors, you know, try catch, and any error that occurs that's you know, surprising to you, if you want to keep that from destroying the, the caller program, then in the catch block, you can do promise.reject. So they kind of combine that way. Good question. Error handling is really like probably the best reason to use this, right? So you won't miss edge cases. Um, and so now I'll demonstrate. So I think the rest of this is going to be more or less happy path code. And um, the example of a, of a method call, uh, this is kind of what set me on this direction to begin with. Um, I have to go to, uh, to the web here to demo this live, and you guys can go there too. But <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, helpers exist. Suppose that there's two reactive variables, and as they change, you need to pass them into a server-side call and ha always have this, uh, this uh, field update reactively, not only on account of these values changing, but has to also do the round trip to the server. So basically there was no way to, to do that that I saw um, in, in, in like a very clean way. And so I was discussing with uh, Sashko of, uh, of MDG, and he had a package, and I looked at it, and I found like some weird edge cases in it, and so I kind of forked this off so without further ado, let me show you some, some code here. Eight 
small. There she is. Wow. Oh, you're right. Blah, 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 a lot of text. Um, please read it. Um, and I think I linked to the uh, promises specification. Definitely read that as well. But this is a utility to um, get the most out of uh, um, async by using promises. So suppose you have a server method that takes some time to complete and uh, it just basically concatenates two strings, I mean, for this example. And you want to make this server call, you want to write a helper that says take, take the value of these two fields and uh, can, you know, call the server call and whatever its result is, you know, return it. So um, there's a couple of things involved in this that are just kind of boilerplate. You need two reactive vars. And um, once you have them, you can write this helper server call with latency as follows. You basically write it like you would uh, a normal a normal helper. So here is the function that takes the names of two fields and looks them up and does a get on the corresponding reactive Rs and then passes value one and value two to basically a meteor dot call. But instead of dot call you see dot promise. And that does the call but returns a promise for that call. And um, before that promise has fulfilled, we need to have something to display there, so we're gonna use this text loading. And then we're gonna pass those two things to this wrapper function, reactive promise, right? So I said there's functions that can convert uh, between different styles. So this takes a promise style async function and turns it into a reactive uh, style function so that we do this, and you say, foos, there's your 750 milliseconds. And you see other calls occurring. And that is, that is what you've got. Here's, here's the, the all code, the meteor method, a helper that takes a couple of parameters. I just did that to illustrate that you can, you can take parameters to functions and still just wrap them in reactive promise. And then there's a call to reactive promise that wraps your function, which otherwise works normally. This works outside of helpers as well, uh, as the test suite illustrates. And um, yeah, and then you return a promise from the method. And then this is just some code to uh, make sure that as you change the uh, text boxes, the reactive vars behind the scene get updated. Um, you can extend this, right? So um, here's an example of the same server method, but we're going to do multiple calls. And I, I regret not having a third text box here so that you can show that it's the sum of one plus another. But here I'll show you the, uh, the, the code there. So here we do a promise to add arg1 get and arg2 get. And then there's dot then, then we receive the result into a variable, and then we add the term server says in front of that, and then pass the result back in, and then add a smiley face on the end, because why not? And then what we're returning is this entire thing. So this entire chain of thens becomes a single promise, a single promise for when all of these actions have completed. And that's what's going to go into um, the text box. Uh, where is it? Text box here. Fizzle. Fizzle. -y. Right? So this time I took out the latency, so you can't see the delay because I thought that'd be uh, egregious. But it is, in fact, if you, if you see what's going on um, uh, on the server, um, not running this locally, um, but you'll see that it's making multiple meteor method calls to fulfill that promise. 
Any questions about that? Let me put the code up there just in case anybody. See no, no uh, exception handling there. <clears throat> and speaking of uh, exceptions, uh, I am handling an interrupt right now that says pizza is ready. Do you need any time to get ready? Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you for part one. Let's get some pizza, everybody. doing its work in an uninterruptible way on a single stack of papers at a time. All right, and so focused, completely uninterruptible. Well, <clears throat> fibers allow this to behave a little more like a rational human being would, right? So if you're working hard at something and you're maybe three levels deep into yak shaving and then your coworkers say, hey, it's time for lunch, uh, maybe you actually put that work on hold and go out to lunch and then come right back in and resume it in exactly the place that you left off. So basically, what fiber, so um, for example, in uh, the server side method calls, you have, has anyone seen something that goes uh, this dot unblock in a, in a meteor method call? It's like, what does this dot unblock do? So basically, while the stack is being processed, this dot unblock says, it's okay, you can pause, you can leave the stack in exactly where it is, you can pull another item off of the task queue or event loop and start working on it. So um, the, writing five raw fibers code is, is like a bit of a pain in the butt. I've honestly never attempted it. I only use like meteor.wrap async. But if it was just mystical what fibers were doing, all I was saying is like giving this accountant guy another desk on which to pull an item off of the event loop and then work and process the full stack of that, or maybe then say unblock once again and then start a new stack of work. Um, but either way, your code looks like it's synchronous because things call each other you know, linearly, but um, in between, the event loop gets to run a few more times because you're able to just pause and resume the stack. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about fibers or how they fit into this? Because I'm not going to cover them anymore after this. Okay. All right. That's that's fibers. That's just basically being able to like put a call stack on hold and then uh, you know go and do something else. Okay. So lastly, the example that I have here. Yeah, let's get this. Uh, a little help. Hi, Sierra. Need a little help with uh, front end stuff, um, but basically, it, it's a, I, I've I've written a gist or two in my time and uh, published them, and I don't have like a real blogging thing. But um, inside the gist, I sometimes want to put a, a, a reference to itself on the web, right? So my workflow is like write an article, publish it to the web so that it has somewhere to go get a short URL, like bit.ly, bit.ly bit for that new location, because the location didn't exist before I published it. So get the short URL, put it back into um, the document, and republish it. And it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but I tried doing it you know, with a number of approaches, like reactivity, and ultimately like the promises-based approach was pretty much the, uh, the most straightforward version that I could come up with. So uh, I'll just show you that, just to give you an idea of like how to combine things together. And uh, I might be in the way for you people over there. Can you see? Okay. So um, so how it works is that uh, we're also just incidentally using a uh, a thing called the view model framework. 
that you know previously in the other examples you saw reactive vars and then you saw like event handlers to say when someone presses a key in this field you know change this reactive var to keep it up to date so in this example i'm using a tool called view model when i was talking about branded and unbranded technologies view models have been around for a long time they're not react they're not angular but they're really powerful where uh, you can write a template that basically has this data bind command and um, your view model will say there's a published URL, there's a published revision, the revision will change in between the first publish and when I put the short URL in there, uh, there's a short URL and then uh, this button will be enabled if there's a publish in progress. So first let me show you the demo. Here is the text, la la la, live, la la, and then uh, I'm using simulated set timeouts. I'm not actually publishing it to, uh, to the web. But what you see is that, oh, why did that thing not update? Wow, that's great. That's like one of those live demo snafus. I think I know why, because of space bars escaping. Um, so there's no published URL, there's no published revision, but watch the order that these fill in. I hit publish, the button goes grayed out. First I get a URL and revision, then I get a bit.ly, and then the revision updates, okay? So um, the pseudocode for this, if you could just write synchronous code, this would be really easy. <clears throat> if you didn't have to update the UI as each piece of information came in. Set in progress to true, set some placeholder text. The placeholder text is already, is already there. This is the placeholder text. Um, publish the post, getting back, uh, a location and the initial revision, shorten the location to a short URL, do that search and replace that is currently not working, and then update it again and set in progress to false. So if you had to nest callbacks to do this, it would look pretty ugly. But turns out for the first publish, we can pretty much start inside a publish function. And the view model is like, as we update the fields here by calling them and passing values to them. This just, uh, for example, this line sets publish in progress to true to disable the uh, publish button from running again, which says enabled is the opposite of whether there's a publish in progress. So we call methods on the view model. Uh, we set properties by saying view model dot the property and then passing it a value. So first we just do that. Then we start a chain. We start publishing the post. That's going to return a promise for the eventual uh, two fields of data that we're going to get. This is ECMAScript 6 or JavaScript 2015 uh, parameter destructuring. So this is like an object that has these two fields and it automatically pulls them apart into the two variables. Um, and so we basically extract these fields from an object and then update the view model with them and then this step returns the result of setting the published URL. So basically the published URL is the thing that gets fed into the next step, make sure URL. Make sure URL receives the return value of the previous step and returns a short URL to the next step in the chain. The next step in the chain updates the UI with it. It does the search and replace and returns the new post text after the search and replace. This step gets the post text, updates the post, um, and then uh, that gives us one more, uh, the URL is gonna be the same, so we ignore it, but it gives us one more URL and revision. The only thing we need to update is the revision, and then the set the publish in progress flag um, to false. And if this is the code that's actually running, I can see why we have a problem, and it's because after we do the replace, um, we're not actually updating the view model. So that's why when we run the demo, uh, this is not updating, but everything else is happening uh, completely normally. It's disabled, it goes, it goes, it goes. We just, I forgot a line when I was editing this last night to actually tell the UI to update from that. 
Now, um, this relies on a publish post function, and in this case, it's just stub out with a timeout to resolve with, uh, makes up a, a new object ID and a revision. And so this is returning a promise for an eventual um, URL and revision that isn't known for a thousand milliseconds. Update post looks very similar um, to that, but it gives you a new revision, but it returns the published URL that uh, was originally. And then make sure URL just takes the first few characters of that and pretends it's a, it's a bitly URL. Any questions on this? So the second time through, um, you don't actually have to republish this, right? So I made this so that um, you, know, you, you might continue editing this post, right? And you just might want to click um, publish post more than once. So you don't want to actually change the published URL when you republish. Uh, you might get a different revision. You will get a different revision, and you just did. Um, but you're not going to change your bit.ly URL or your published URL. So promises let you, uh, in this case, return um, an immediate resolution for the case that you already have published the post once. So let me show you what the first publish looked like compared to what uh, a later publish looks like. So I've decided to call a different method upsert post, which will, won't do additional work if the post already exists. And also get short URL instead of make short URL. And then update post looks at whether we have the published URL uh, already or not. If it's empty, we have to go through the work of publishing the post. And since that returns a promise, that is like the interface for this method. So we return a promise for a newly published post, or we return a promise that resolves immediately. Like I showed earlier, where you know the value already, you can also just hand off a resolve, uh, a value that is synchronously determined. The consumer of this, just all it knows is it has a promise. It, eventually, you'll have um, a published URL and published revision. And then likewise with get short URL, you can do the same thing where you return a promise for an async function or uh, an immediate function. And you notice that really this chain doesn't, doesn't change much at all, right? You can put conditionality in each step and change what's returned. So simple example, missing one line of code, I'm sorry about that. But um, pretty neat way of composing uh, steps that occur out of sync and at no point in time like freeze up the UI. So that's what I'm working on. Um, thanks for your attention. Um, Sashko uh, of MDG was maintaining a, a package to do something like this and uh, he called it a reactive method. And from our discussions, he, he wants to actually take it down and focus on other things. So uh, perhaps this uh, meteor.promise will you know, kind of be the way going forward. Uh, if not, it doesn't have to be. You can just use this package as is. Um, also, I spoke with someone over, over the pizza table about like, what part of this is MDG you know, doing? Is this like some rogue effort that is at odds with MDG? And I just wanted to summarize that like, Promises are part of all newer browsers that run uh, ECMAScript 6, so you don't have to worry about those being like out in left field. Um, this particular package is polyfilling um, down to older browsers, but since I started work on this, MDG has also provided a package called Promise, which does polyfilling. I'll probably make that a dependency of this package so that you know it's not redundant. Um, it wouldn't be anyway, because if it finds a promise implementation, it uses it, otherwise it, it polyfills it. And um, you know, future work to be done here uh, is really just to, once you've included this, and I don't know that MDG has any plans uh, uh, to do this, but how there's meteor.wrap async for callback functions on the server, I think there should be uh, a version of that to, to take any uh, function like meteor.call and turn it into a promise returning function. Because when I said meteor.promise, 
you know, I, when I chose that as the name for this, um, it was as if that was the only thing you would want to get a promise for, and it's not. It's really any callback returning function. So the API uh, may change a little bit, but even if you don't use this package, I hope you can uh, put promises to work for you in your code uh, as soon as possible. And thank you. show you how to chain uh, behavior together in a better way. Um, it's it's pretty deep topic, a little bit out of scope here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, are there any like performance differences between promises and callbacks or just uh, code clearing? There should be no performance differences between callbacks and promises because uh, they should always cause the callback or the promised step to occur in the next turn of the event loop. There's always a difference between real performance and perceived performance. Um, in, in real performance, throwing pieces of your work into the future seems like it will make it take longer. And in terms of perceived performance, it is doing that that actually allows uh, the browser not to appear hung and frozen. And even inside of MDG's code, there's certain things that they do where um, They'll do a thousand iterations and then let some other code run and then do a thousand iterations. So for perceived performances, uh, for perceived performance promises, you know, win hands down. And it's you know microseconds that you're you know putting in between each chunk of functionality. So I don't think there's a real loss in the real performance. Another question back there. Uh, question. Uh, your example is actually working. Ah, ah, that is, yeah, thank you, thank you. Probably because it's Chrome. It's, it's Chrome and I, because <laughs> it's not, it's not Mozilla, yeah. It's, <laughs> Gecko rocks. Thanks for having us, by the way. All right, thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to jump into this really quickly. My time with you guys up here is going to be very short. I'm Ryan. I am one of the founders of Raise Your Flag. My duty in front of you tonight is to tell you the why. Sergey is going to tell you the what and the how, and that will take up the bulk of this, I promise. Uh, so just really quickly, for the past nine years, I've been traveling across Canada and the United States uh, speaking to high school kids. And I've spoken to about 900,000 kids to date. Uh, I wrote a book for high school kids that was acquired and published and sent out to bookstores all around the world. The past few years in particular, I've been spending a lot of time speaking to kids that are not going to university or college. Um, four years ago, I was at this conference in Mississauga. I was the keynote speaker. I get up there, I do my bit, I get off stage. All the kids in the audience were not university, not college-bound students. They were going to work after high school. I got off stage, this kid comes and introduces himself to me as Michael. And uh, Michael's chin is quivering, he looks like he's ready to cry. And he tells me that his uh, friends and his family don't know that he's at that conference. And uh, I asked Michael why, and he said, do you have any idea how embarrassing it is when all of your friends are opening up a university acceptance letter and you're the loser in the corner who doesn't know what he's doing with his life? And I thought, well, it's gonna suck for Michael, but I'm sure he's the minority. I grew up in Ajax, Ontario. I went through 12 years of formal education that says everybody goes to university because that's how you become successful. Uh, but it turns out that Michael's not alone. It turns out that 45% of kids in Canada and the United States go to work as their primary post-secondary destination. And when I found that out, I felt kind of obligated to do something about it. And we started building Raise Your Flag for the millions of Michaels in Canada and the United States. Raise Your Flag is career paths for kids that are not going to university or college, the skills that they need, and the companies that will hire them. And Sergey will go in and dive into all the nuts and bolts and how this pertains to Meteor, but Sergey is the guy for that. If you guys have questions afterwards about the business and about how we landed on this problem and what we're doing specifically, I'm the guy to talk to about that. 
But for now, let's give it to Sergey. Ryan is the speaker. I don't do this at all. If you guys need the mic, if you guys need me to talk into that. Sounds good. Sounds good, all right. So this is Raise Your Flag. Um, what I'm gonna do, I guess, this is more or less like <clears throat> me going through building in Meteor, um, why we chose Meteor, how it works, and how it's doing in the real world. I mean, there's a lot of talk about Meteor being like, obviously it's awesome, but there's a lot of talk about people being like, well, I'm not really sure about Meteor in terms of scalability, I'm not really sure about how it's gonna work with a real production app with like millions of users. Um, we're not there yet, so I'm not gonna be touching base on that, but just like real issues that we're dealing with and real things that are happening. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the landing page. Um, you go into career paths. Um, you get these guys here, which are all the careers. Um, so we're, why we chose Meteor, I guess, is more of a kind of like, I'm really new to development. I didn't go to university while well, I went for a year. I didn't have anything else to bounce off of. Like a lot of a lot of people go into Meteor from a different platform. I'm going into Meteor from nothing. So for me, it's the only thing that I'm really comfortable with. And from what I can see and from what I've worked on before, there's not there's literally zero things that are wrong with it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that out there. I'm, I don't care. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the reason I got introduced to Meteor is because my brother went to San Francisco and he joined the Meteor Development Group as a community developer. He's not a real developer, I'm the real guy. <laughs> but his, his job was to spread the word, build the community. Um, I'm his brother, so he's like, you have n no other choice. Here's Meteor, try it, see what you can do with it. So played around with it. Um, I've been doing stuff in media for about a year and a half, and this is what we came up with, and this is what I can do now. So it's it's rewarding to me to see that a framework like this exists, where you pretty much need no background knowledge, nothing whatsoever. You have the tools there. Just go ahead and do it. So. Um, Kind of the basics of the app. We're using Flow Router instead of Iron Router. Um, why we did that is uh, an advisor told us kind of to check it out. But I mean, it was interesting for me to try something new because I haven't used Flow Router before, and uh, why not? So far, it's been great. Like I, I haven't had that much experience with Iron Router to be like, oh, it's better, oh, it's worse. There is bunch of articles, a bunch of talks, a bunch of people doing the debate. Um, for me, it makes it a lot easier than Iron Router because you have your subscriptions, they're not bound to the route itself. So you can do template subscriptions. And I believe Meteor did that out of the box in like 1.04. But um, with Flow Router it makes it like it's just really easy. You don't, you're not bound to the route, you're bound to the template. So if I want to use React or Angular, I can just switch it up and be able to do that. Um, we have tap I18N. So for French, you got this little switch here, click it, and play. Instant. I don't know, I've never, I don't, I don't go to websites to look for those kind of things, but to me, the change is like click of a button and you get everything in French, which is amazing. Um, the way that it's done in code, it's you have your English dictionary and you have your French one, and everything corresponds. And then code, you just use. Can you make the font bit bigger? Yeah, so in code you got, I guess it's more of top of here or um, Yeah, so this is handlebars and underscore and then the actual. 
actual variable from the dictionary. So it makes it super easy to do that. Um, so what we're what we're trying to do for users, because like what do you we don't want to be just providing more content, like providing more resumes for these companies or like giving these people right now well, what somebody can do is if they go to a career path, um, retail sales. So we got a path out here. These are the different occupations, the last one being the career path itself. Um, all the stuff around here is about it, about the industry. And if you want to be a retail sales associate, you can hit retail, sign up. And you can search for a retail sales associate in Toronto. So it's just, I'm taking it from Facebook. When you sign up with Facebook, I'm taking their age and I'm taking their location. If they sign up, with email, we just ask them to input those fields too, so we make it a little more localized. Um, we're working on improving that. But also we kind of want to move away from, this is just taking Indeed API and populating a bunch of their positions. They're not amazingly optimized. Um, what we want to do is we want to build value to these users so that companies can look at them, not just as someone that didn't go to college or university and just throw out their resume, but as someone that has went through something or like built up value for themselves that they can take in on their board. So what we want to do is um, have a bunch of badges, so more like challenges. So there's a bunch of stuff around this for coding, like there's all these different platforms where you can learn how to code and you get badges for it and those are kind of recognized. Um, so we want to do the same for these kids and have them complete these badges, which consist for now of just three challenges, whatever you want to accept this challenge, Facebook challenge, you get a little write-up about it, you get the challenge for it, and the text input, complete it, somebody completes it. Um, we send it off. So we're. In terms of UI, we're going to have like a little model that pops up, says thank you. Um, if it's their first challenge, there will be something, whatever it will be. And then we get an email on our side um, with their answer, who they are. We track that. And then right now, we consider the challenge complete. So if we go back to the badge, um, they're going to get one of these completed. It's going to say it's completed. And if they go to their profile, View their badges, <clears throat> they can see that the badge is complete and they need two more to complete and then once they complete the badge, they're kind of recognized for that skill. Um, so what we want to do is we want to partner up with companies and get their feedback and get their information on what they need in these people that doesn't require college or university that we can put into these little challenges to build value for these users. Any questions so far? Yeah, Paul. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you should post things. Uh, where are they being taken in from? Like Monster? Do they have APIs open for it? For uh, for the job postings on the list. Uh, for the job postings, they're from Indeed. Okay. So they have open APIs that you can use. Um. Yeah. Uh, where is that? The job search. Again, needed. Let's go here. So the the uh, we fill out one of those challenges. Mm -hmm. Who who gets the like? Do, do the employers see those um, their responses in order to, to like like evaluate them, or or do you guys just say okay that was, that was a good response? For that? now, because we just rolled out this feature, like I finished it all up to today. Um, eventually, down the road, I think we'll have employers be able to see all these users, which users completed the challenges and then have that kind of basis. So we're, we're kind of the middle people now, but we want to be able to, them be able to communicate with each other as well. So have an employer create, a, create an account with us, and then they'll see all the users, and potentially have that communication. Just any anytime I went to a job board to search for something, they're all really outdated, they don't look good, they don't feel good. It just takes away from the experience, and you kind of, you get, 
piled up with all these applications that you have to submit and it's just it's not a great process for somebody that didn't go to university or college doesn't have something to put on their resume it like it just demotivates them so I think we want to we want to make it a little more exciting for them um, other than that one of the real issue well like a couple of real issues that we're facing with right now is we're posting it on modulus um, it keeps going up and down so if I go to my Kadira <coughs> there's all these drops I have no idea why they're happening right now somebody mentioned that it might be because I'm using spider rebel to crawl for SEO and that spikes it up and then modulus just goes too much CPU too much memory we're gonna cut you off it's a little bit annoying but we're gonna figure that out and in terms of SEO I still don't know why I go to search for raise your flag and get this built with meteor thing. I guess that's the default one. Oh. <laughs> I didn't set like if I go to my head .html. I don't have that title set anywhere. I have my titles set here. So in Safari, can't you do command shift F and search for the string? For ready to code? Yeah. What was it? Built with Meteor. And even the parens, perhaps? Might be buried within some package or something. Or maybe you hosted it on the Meteor site at one point. So take the parens around. Um, I believe that's also a regex string, so the parens might have value in that case. And You'll need to specify the folder as well, right below the search string, as the root folder of your project. Isn't it going to search through the root folder regardless, or? I don't know. If you, you could search for the folder by clicking the ellipsis up to the right of that one. Oh, this guy? I'm going to search it. There you go. Yeah. And then it'll take a little while. Yeah. So I have no idea where that's coming from. Um, when was the last time you told Google to re-index it? I haven't. Today was the day that I put this in there, which I read on Manuel, Manuel, yeah, his blog that he suggests this. Um, we'll see where that goes. <laughs> Sorry. What does that do? Exactly. Oh, that just tells crawlers to that this is a web app and to put a query at the top at the end of your URL for it to crawl it with. Um, crawl it as if it's Ajax. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, a couple of things that happened. We when we launched. We put it up on Hacker News with the title being Built with Meteor. It got up to number two, which was exciting. Um, so yeah, there it is. Um, there was a comment like this, which was fun. Um, username Markdown, thank you. And yeah, Kadira, so this was, uh, Load up maybe. Yeah, so sessions. We got up. Word is off. 300. Awesome. We had 300. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yes, we had 300 real time users. This was when I had my free credits on Modulus. I had $15 free when you sign up with one servo and it was running and it wasn't breaking to us like crazy. So, I guess that goes to show that Modulus is pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't know. More questions? Yeah. Um, what's the UI framework? Sorry? The UI. Oh, Bootstrap. Yeah. So most of it is Bootstrap, and then just Brian sending me something he built in, what was it called? The just in Mind? Yeah, yeah. Just in Mind. Just in Mind. And then I turned it into stuff like this. Um, yeah. Um, so you say you, know, you come from zero background, and 
Did you just invest all your time in like the official docs? Or did you also learn other things on the side to help you in terms of learning Mir? Or was everything just from the script, uh, from the official docs? I think I just went through all the demo apps. I think that's the best way to do. Um, if I got stuck in terms of looking through the code and I didn't understand it, I went to the docs. I still have the docs open all the time because I'm not like completely comfortable with it, but it's definitely, Meteor is definitely a framework where trial and error is the way to go in my personal experience. And it's pretty transparent in terms of what's happening. Um, I haven't done a lot of like Django or Ruby on Rails or anything like that, but I, I saw what there was there, like I saw all these like tutorial apps there, and then I just got turned off by the fact that there's like so many things you have to do before you actually get to the code, you know, before you actually get to actually making the app. You make all these imports and do this and do that. If you miss it somewhere, your whole thing breaks and then you're kind of stuck in that loop. Paul? Uh, so you mentioned Flowrider, but what other packages are you using? Um, what are like the best, most useful things? So the best, most useful, definitely for development, um, this guy here. So you get a little console in your local host to see what you're subscribed to at any given moment. moment, moment. Um, that really helps. Um, yeah, so all the media core ones. Um, Simple schema and collection two, so that just puts my schema. So I just get like a structured database. Um, count fab, count fab, count fab, boom. Yeah, so for all these images, we're using Amazon S3. And I don't really have like a UI to input these career paths because we kind of started, like we had to move it over from, was, was it? Closure. Closure, so we had to move it up from Closure. We had, I had like a big JSON file of all the career paths. Um, the UI wasn't the same, so Ryan took 60 pictures for all these backgrounds for all the career paths, and then I kind of went one by one, or I just ran a loop and populated them into S3, which works pretty well. Um, Flow Router works out of the box with fast render. So you get all your template subscriptions right away. Um, yeah. Um, I think there was a question there. Yeah. The page transitions are also uh, flow router. Uh, page, page transitions template. are momentum. Because they're a bit of a pain with Iron Router. Yeah. So momentum flow router is what I use for these little fades. Um, Sometimes they work, sometimes they're not as great. Okay. Um, and that just me wrapping, or is it? Yeah, so I animate with velocity and then pass in all these properties to what I want to animate. That's for the actual career pass. Um, for the page transitions, I had it somewhere, but I don't know. Um, any more questions? Yeah, getting back to your um, your own experiences on learning uh, Meteor. Yeah. Uh, when you went through the demos, did you try to write your own app to reflect the demo? Um, yeah, I literally just went, Fair. looked at the demo, I didn't clone the code, I didn't do any of that, I just went step by step as they explain it. Um, sometimes I ran into some trouble, but most of the time I, I would go back to like the GitHub repo for all that code, but most of the time kind of worked out of the box, which was interesting. Yeah. And your, uh, your, your, your client-side JavaScript for animating and easing and stuff, is that mostly done through Meteor packages? If you find enough there uh, that you didn't have to kind of like write your own? Yeah, so Woe is the one that does all these little cadence. Yeah. Um, works really well. Um, there's a package that lets me specify, um, where is it? So yeah, our window screen. So it's reactive 
looking at the screen width. So if it's on mobile and I don't want those animations, I can just not have those classes in there, which is really helpful because you don't. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't like it. They don't work really well on mobile. Um, yeah. Uh, for like the English to French, does that mean you don't have any text anywhere? Or you just have these. I just have these guys here. Yeah. And how long did that take you? Like. Um. <laughs> it's an ongoing process. Um, and then in my so for example for a career path, I just have a collect so the actual. Let's just look at it. Localhost. Um, so my career path will be. So I'll have the title itself. Because that's where I'm pulling the slug from, and slugs don't go from it. Because I could have like an English object and a French one, but the automated, like the friendly slugs, doesn't pull it in from inner objects, or I haven't figured out how to do that. So I just have a French one, and then it looks at the session. Um, their API is. Uh, Yeah, so tap 18 and get language again. Doing this, and then if an object, let's say, won't have the French one, it will still want to display something, so it will display the English one. Um, yeah, and then you can like them, and that just. Uh, post. Yeah, if I like this guy. And this is going to be a real straight. Yeah, there you go. There goes modulus. Mongo, how do you want it running on the server? I mean, when in production. How, how do, do I? Get the user from accessing Mongo, is there a specific thing? Um, yeah, so. How would I it's use our. Security wise, that way you your Mac. Oh, right now we just have it literally all set to you can't do any updates from the client to the server. So I'm using like a meteor method. Would do the update, but if somebody goes in the client console, they won't be able to do anything. So you need the client model, you're saying they're not going to do yeah. They could find model. They could find model. They can actually, yeah. Upgrade. Yeah, they could probably fetch the collection if they wanted to, but they won't be able to update it. Yeah, Mongol, Mongol is not deployed to production. Oh, oh yeah, so sorry, this, yeah. I'm just wondering. That's a yeah. Yeah. This guy is not, is not going to be the deployed to production. But yeah, so that's, uh, that's what I have to deal with. Um, any more questions? Yeah? Can you post that, uh, what's the while in the pan transitions, that package, can you post that somewhere so we can uh, take a look at it? Uh, so we have meteor search, I mean on the uh, meetup search. Yeah, I think that's the one. There's a package for momentum for a flow router. Right here. Yeah. That's that. Good job.